Hi, I'm Jude Kelly. I'm the founder of the WOW Foundation, the WOW festivals that are now all over the world. And uh, one of which is in Australia, which is when I first met Kate. But I'm here to interview her and Nina about this amazing film. Uh, she's just won her first award. It'll be one of many. And I hope that the whole crew actually get the accolades they deserve for a very unique glimpse into the life of a female protagonist, a sort of genius with demons, the kind that you normally see portrayed as male, um, and also a same-sex loving but complex relationship with a child involved. Um, again, the sort of thing where you normally see that done as a, a normal kind of heterosexual couple, but actually this is an examination into two mothers with different kinds of needs, but both working in the artistic profession as a kind of rivals in some way, but also as partners. So it's a very, very nuanced film. It also picks up a lot on the Me Too movement and the kind of complexity of power and the use of power and how power can be both intoxicating and get out of control and destroy the person who was enjoying the power for a while and then realizes that they are being taken down very difficult paths. So it's a pleasure to have seen the film and now I've got this pleasure to talk to Kate and Nina. Congratulations to both of you. The performances are riveting and also, you know, researched mm. <laughs> and I wanted mm. to begin with that and so I'm, I was interested in the film in the the tension you know you say in an interview you know she knows Lydia and the tension of holding down the family mm. and the job and making everything negotiable whilst if you like the the other mother which is usually the, the or as, or as guy, Lydia describes herself, the father. The father, mm -hmm. uh, like, does their thing, and is permission to do, given permission to sort of do their thing. Well, I mean, I, I think what is extraordinary about Sharon and Lydia's relationship is it's a relationship of equals. They've decided to undertake the the, the position of the concert master that, that, that Nina plays is a, an incredibly powerful one and almost mm -hmm. like a kingmaker, you know, as you know, in a contemporary orchestra when it's a much more democratic process than yeah. when Furt Wangler was <laughs> running the, the BPO. But it's a very symbiotic, productive relationship where they have co-parented. But I think the interesting thing to remember is that they have come out of a very silent pandemic in which they have not been able to do what they love. Mm -hmm. And there's probably been a lot of pressure brought to bear on their little nuclear family because, mm -hmm. of course, they have an adopted child. And I think the film describes the relationship that Lydia has with Petra, uh, her, her daughter, extraordinary actress. Mila was just amazing yeah, to she play was with. Them. Yeah. Amazing. We're so lucky to have found her. We were panicking. We wouldn't have. Um, it's one of the most authentic and important relationships she has. Um, and so that you wouldn't expect from a character um, like Lydia. So I think that there's, there's so much nuance um, that Todd has described, unexpected nuance, I think, in, in their relationship, the way they perceive their family and the way they have made value-based mm -hmm. decisions and the way they choose to work together externally. Lydia, as it is at the perhaps at the, the the more public profile end of you know the figurehead of the um, uh, of their of their relationship, but um, Sharon is definitely you know in the engine room. Yes. You know, so relationships are never what they seem to be on the surface. No, but obviously you know Lydia has an enormous personal and professional crisis, and. The family is completely shattered, mm -hmm. sort of destroyed, and you could kind of see it coming from the beginning of the film. Mm. So right from the start, you could see that there's a tension. Well, yes, there's a volcanic tension, yes. isn't there? Because yeah. there's a history which they're both aware of, and I was wondering whether, bearing in mind the Me Too movement had been going on for so long, and you know, in the classical music world, you would have had James Levine and you know, Charles Tetois and Kevin Spacey in theatre and, you know, mm. et cetera. They must have talked about all of that. So you implied in one interview that 
maybe she was complicit, maybe they kind of knew what they were holding down, like how she was already abusing power. And how much do you think trying to stay as a family was helping to maintain or enable behaviour that couldn't be condoned? It's interesting, though. Sorry to keep to, to, no, to talking, please. but but it, the power of the film that Todd has made is it's very um, ambiguous as to what has actually gone on. The very opening frame of the film is two people texting on the mobile phone uh -huh. saying, "Do you love her?" Um, and this Antar is asleep, so she's oblivious to the way she's being discussed. And I think it's a bit of a Rorschach test for an audience as to what they... There's no one entirely guilty and mm -hmm. no one is entirely innocent. And I think, therefore, it's a really nuanced examination of systemic power. As you know, mm -hmm. in historically, um, it's a very um, patriarchal, pyramidical structure, the way very, orchestral yeah. mu music takes place. And that the, the, um, the merest whiff of uncertainty or doubt or insecurity or um, lack of um, historically male types of decisions that are made by the maestro on the podium, the orchestra will turn the other way. So there's an expectation that, that a conductor behaves in a certain way. Yeah. And you have to think about the generation that, that Lydia grew up in as a, as a conductor, as an artist. There, were no, there was no one to model herself on that didn't behave in that way. And I think that those, um, those organisations often enable or expect certain types of behaviour that perhaps people wouldn't behave that way if the organisations weren't structured that way. Yeah. Because I do think artists, it's really important that, that artists are often disobedient and challenge rules and move around because and that those two freedoms to do that enable us to challenge societal structures and if we start self-censoring if we start saying that the artists shouldn't dissent wouldn't we cannot protest then how do we actually genuinely permanently change those patriarchal structures and so I think that the film deals with all of that it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't give you an easy baddie it doesn't give you an easy goodie this isn't a this isn't a conventional relationship and I'm not talking about their gender or their sexual orientation I'm saying about the the complicity and the symbiosis that exists in this relationship and also with the, the members of the orchestra the members of the board who perhaps are, in the end, the most powerful people in the film. I absolutely understand that the, you know, the classical music structure is historically hugely, not just patriarchal, but sort of power-based. And mm. the idea of the sort of the, the genius, evil or not, is, you know, is, expected. A, a, is expected and allowed. And but I was really trying to dig a little bit, if I mm -hmm. can ask you, mm -hmm. about whether, as a, as, as a mother... Mm -hmm a wife, mm -hmm. a partner, and a fellow artist, mm -hmm. when you see behaviour that is taking Lydia off the rails psychologically as well as professionally, mm -hmm. whether, you know, bearing in mind they must have had discussions about all of these things, especially Me Too, whether you feel that she was unable to insist on her equality. Sharon? Yeah, you know, I, what I found interesting to think of is that you think you have a certain position in a relationship. And maybe you think you're s slightly more, in lack of a better word, like a, on the victim side, or that something you, you don't have, hold everything that happens in your hands. It's more Lydia that drives the whole uh, car. But maybe it's you, <laughs> you know, but you think you like yourself in this position of being mistreated and not being, she doesn't share enough with me, she doesn't, there's a secret and I don't know what it is, and which is certainly something that Sharon is grappling with yeah. and that she tries to understand and she tries to hold the family together when she says, I'm bringing Petra to school. She's very happy about that, but also in the scene before, she says to her, well, our daughter is being bullied, Maybe you want to do something about it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Why doesn't Sharon do that? She's, in her own right, a very uh, accomplished personality and a strong personality who, who would be able to handle it, but it would maybe uh, involve longer discussions and being diplomatic and whatnot, and she knows she will do the job quicker and more <laughs> effective, <laughs> you know? So that, that's, that's the dynamic. So at what point 
does Sharon push her into being that person? And maybe that's also what she finds fascinating about her. But then to the outside world, you know, you're kind of, you have to portray like, yeah, this is outrageous, you know, this is not a behavior. I, 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 I don't agree with this behavior. You know? yes. But inside, you, you, you allow it, it in some way. Know? Or you yeah, even adore or it. You, yeah. uh, you find it fascinating. Yeah. So it's, we are flawed, you know, and, 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 and that, to, to allow us to go there and to find all these little nuances so that you have to think about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, th that was the fun with Todd, you know, that he really went, open, uh, open it, let's not, let's examine who we are mm. yes. and how we deal with each other. And keep it open-ended. Yeah, and, and, sh and Sharon doesn't know what's happening with Lydia. She doesn't understand everything. She's not innocent and naive, but she doesn't understand everything that's going on. She just tries to leave as much space because that's at least she's an intelligent person. She knows she can't hold her. Mm -hmm. She tries in the beginning, in my opinion, by being having a heart problem, you know, so she needs to be there and care. <laughs> yes. Which is also a little trick. Okay, uh, so there's know. manipulation so it's, in some yeah, way. There's, the there's a manipulative point yes. in it. If you want to see it, maybe you don't see it because, you know, but it, it's, it's just something to there for your disposal to, th mm -hmm. to think about it, to think about uh, relationships. And in the, in the piece, the idea that, you know, give people too much power, it will corrupt them. Mm it will distort their worldview. They will take uh, liberties with power. That's something that you've talked about, Kate, quite a lot in interviews. And how much does that sort of sense of knowing that your personality and your actions are being kind of poisoned by the power, how much is that something which is excused by genius in her mind or by kind of the idea that she's entitled to take what she wants or act in a particular kind of set of ways. I mean, I, I accept that there's no proof that she's actually driven this woman to suicide. There's no proof that she is the person who is a predator um, in a serial way. But she, she's obviously going through a huge amount of mental torment herself about her own ethics and values. I think much, much of Lydia Tarr's um, backstory... Um, is invented. She's running from herself. And at a certain point in one's life, you can't run anymore, yeah. both as a human being and as, and as an artist. And I think that that's what you're seeing, is you're seeing... Uh, you, it's interesting you described her before as being volcanic. I think she's going through a deep existential, physical, and spiritual crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's interesting that she saved Marla's Fifth, which is a meditation on loss and love, till last. Um, because ha perhaps that's the most difficult thing. That level of intimacy is perhaps one of the most difficult things for her to approach. You know, I always thought about her. You know, when you think about bullies, you have to think about what happened to them as children. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, th I thought about her living in an incredibly silent household. Um, you know, I imagined her parents were deaf and she had this extraordinary... Um, facility with um, uh, oversensitivity to sound and the guilt that comes with that and also that she probably didn't find her mentor and from her perspective watching Bernstein Bernstein's children's concerts on television he was her mentor and so who's to say that that's not, what is a mentor so the, 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 the truths and lies that she's told herself have become so complicated and enmeshed but one of the things that I thought was unassailably true about um, that happens in that long prologue at the beginning is that she spent five years with the Shipibo Kinibo people. And I yeah. think that the, that ethnomusicology, that interest in indigenous cultures, um, not assuming that the Western canon was the be all and end all, was part of her DNA. And that here you find her at the zenith of white male um, Western musical culture. And so she's out of sync with herself and so therefore where she ends up in the movie is perhaps back to her core place so she's become estranged from herself and I think that those um, the fact that, that she's in that that space turning 50 um, at, a, at a midpoint of her um, you know her point as, as, as an artist I think that the, that she realises in a way that, that being the head of this massive institution which she f it will not single handedly be able to change has corrupted her relationship mm -hmm. not only to her artistry but in her personal relationships and that she needs to explode that apart so I kept thinking about her in a way as being um, 
an an agent in her own destruction. Okay, so she's pressing the button in a sense because somewhere inside her she sort of knows that actually she can't be truthful. Unconsciously. So, short, sharp, intense. Uh, the film is intense. I hope that you'll enjoy watching the film as a whole. I hope you'll do that. But I also hope that at WOW in March, 10th, 11th and 12th in London, or anywhere in the world, there are many WOWs right across the world. I hope that you'll join us where we tease out in a really complex, honest, joyful, humorous, sane way, the fact that it's just not easy at all to try to reach a world of equality when we're groomed to have expectations about others and ourselves. And we also need to grab whatever opportunities we've got. And sometimes that can make us very prone to selfishness or worse. We've got absolutely everything on offer in WOW. We can talk about everything. There's no taboos. There's everything on offer. Please be part of our community if you're not already. Um, It's fun and it's fierce. And it's as truthful as this film tries to be.